has met the need of your heart and of your life. This has been a good day of the Lord. We thank God for his presence, power, and spirit that's real in our hearts and lives today. I thank God for the way he's been blessing in this revival meeting, the way God has met with us from night to night, and honored his word, and the way you have been so responsive to the word of God from night to night as it's gone forth. And I just trust that it has found a place in your heart that you won't soon forget what this evangelist has tried to tell you in this revival meeting. God's trying to get a message over to his people in this hour. And that is that if we want to be ready, we're going to have to have a revival. Praise God. It's so good to see you in the house of God tonight. We're glad for all the home folks and the visitors that have come to be with us in this service tonight. We just want each one of you to receive from the Lord those things that will be a blessing to your heart and to your life. Let me say that you have honored me by asking me to come and be your evangelist this week. I just trust that something that I'll say or do this week will be a blessing to you, an encouragement to you, strengthen your life to live on for God, to serve God, to draw closer to the Lord, to be ready when Jesus comes or when he calls. We've had a good host of visitors from night to night. It seems like we've had a different church represented nearly every night. Praise God. We're sorry they don't come back, but anyway, we've been at one night. Praise the Lord. We're glad you're here tonight. We're glad for all the home folks and the visitors that have come to be with us in this service tonight. At the onset of this message that the Lord has laid upon my heart, you know, we're living in a time when everybody is demanding equal time. You know, if the president gives a State of the Union address, if he's a Republican, then the Democrats have to give what they call the Democratic response. If somebody writes an article and puts it in the newspaper, then they'll leave a little caption down there that responsible parties can give the opposing view. Or you listen to an editorial on the radio, and the man, when he finishes, says there will be time given to responsible parties for a rebuttal. Last night, I came to this pulpit, and I endeavored to preach to you on a very wonderful, marvelous, glorious subject called heaven. I believe heaven is one of the landmark doctrines of the Word of God. It's the hope of the people of God. It's the home of the redeemed. And I tried to bring out everything that I could think of about heaven. I mentioned very little the horrors and awfulness of, of hell in last night's message. I tried to deal with heaven. I tried to make it sound so wonderful that anybody would want to go to heaven. And yet when I threw out the gospel net last night and tried to get lost men and women to come to this altar to make plans to go to that wonderful place called heaven. There wasn't a budge from the center in this building. Well, I believe we want to give equal time to the flip side of that coin. I want to give equal time to the other side of that message. And I've got to deal with the subject God laid on my heart even today. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with us to the book of Isaiah chapter 5. And the book of Proverbs chapter 27. And ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 5. And directing your attention to verse number 14. Isaiah said, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Then in the book of Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 20, the writer said, Hell and destruction are never full, so are the eyes of man are never satisfied. Would you join me in prayer? Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, and you may be seated. Praise God. I do want to draw particular attention to these passages of Scripture we've read in your hearing. But the truth is I simply want to use this as a foundation for what the Lord has laid upon my heart for this service tonight. There are three things that you need to know about hell tonight. And they are that hell is never full and that hell is enlarging itself and opening its mouth without measure. And as I said last night, just in passing by, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, hell is your home. There are three things about the human race that are true. You are born and you live and you die. You had very little to say about how you were 
were born into what family that you were born into, what race or what nationality that you are. You had very little to say about your birth. You had nothing to say about who your parents were. You had nothing to say about whether or not you were black or white, Indian or Mexican or Hispanic or whatever. You had nothing to say, my friend, about where you stand on the social scale. It doesn't matter, my friend, if you're rich or poor or somewhere in between. You had nothing to do with that. You had nothing to do with your birth. You'll probably have very little to do with your death. When death knocks on the door, you will answer that door. When that time comes, it won't matter whether you had plenty as far as this world is concerned or whether you had nothing. You will answer that door. It won't matter how many doctors are standing around and how much medicine they can pump into you. My friend, when death calls, you will answer that call. You had nothing to say about your birth. You'll probably have very little to say about your death. But my friend, how you live between birth and death will determine where your soul is going to spend eternity. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of your sins and live a godly life, you can be ready to go to heaven when you die. If you don't repent of your sins, if you live an ungodly life and live in rebellion all the days of your life, you will go to that awful place called hell. Can somebody say Amen. Amen. Hebrews 9 and 27 says that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. I told you last night that a doctor told me one time, said, well, Brother Oliver, it looks like you're going to die. I told him there's very few people that got out of here alive. From Adam to you sitting on the pew, all humanity has faced death's door. Only two that got out of here alive, and that was Enoch and Elijah, and of course the Lord can say, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. But everybody from Adam to you sitting on that pew tonight, death has knocked on the door, and they answered that door, and how you live between now and then will determine where your soul is going to spend eternity. Death is not the end, my friend. In fact, it is just the beginning. There was a time when you were not, but it will never be said again that you do not exist. As the songwriter said, where will you be a million years from now? Will you be happy? Will you be seen? While ages roll throughout eternity, you're sure to be somewhere. Where will you be? My friend, somewhere in eternity you're going to be somewhere. You're either going to be with the Lord in the splendors and glories of heaven, or you're going to be rolling and screaming in the awful flames of a devil's hell. Hell is a real place. Can somebody say amen? amen. There are only two places that this Bible speaks about. They are the heaven of God and the hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. If there was some other place, Brother Harry, I would talk about it tonight. If there was some sort of a halfway house or a limbo state that you could go into, I would tell you about it. When you close your eyes in death here, you're either going to heaven or you're going to that awful place called hell. Jesus told that thief on the cross, said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. You're not going to some limbo room for a little while. You go straight to heaven or you go straight to hell. The rich man died and the Bible said in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. So there is not much preaching and teaching about hell in this day. There was a time in the holiness church when it was preached about very often. If you sat under a holiness preacher's preaching very long, he would tell you about this place called hell. There's come to a day, friend, when people don't want to hear much, even about heaven. They don't want to hear much about hell, and for sure they don't want to hear anything about the judgment. Hell has become a joke in the world that you and I are living in. People joke about hell. They joke about the climate in hell. They joke about their friends being in hell. They joke about the government that is in hell. But I've come to tell you, hell is no joke. There's nothing funny about hell. My friend, as Brother Harry said last night, if you wake up in that awful place called hell, five minutes after you've been there, you'll give a thousand worlds over. 
just to get out of that awful place called hell. The old timers, my friend, preached about hell. And they preached it, holiness or hell. You're either going to live right now or you're going to that awful place called hell. They preached it hot and they preached it straight and there was nothing funny about it. There was nothing to laugh about. It was not a joke under them. Hell was just as real as the heaven they planned on going to. Most congregations today are not hearing anything about hell. In fact, most of them are hearing some sort of a watered down, salt soap message that won't get you from where you are to where God is. Seldom are they ever warned about hell. But I've come to tell you, friend, if I started preaching on hell right now and preached on hell every night until the Lord calls this preacher home, it probably still wouldn't be enough to touch men's hearts and to bring them away from that awful place called hell. Because I've come to tell you that the greatest hellfire and brimstone preacher this world has ever known was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Can somebody say amen to that? It was not the Apostle Paul. It was not Simon Peter. It was not anybody other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, ten times in that sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, he mentioned the subject called hell. We find as he's leaving this earth on the Mount of Olives to go back to heaven once again, he's saying he that believeth and is baptized is going to be saved, and he that believeth not is going to be damned. He's warning them about that awful place called hell. So many times we talk about heaven and, and we say things like the word of God says, I have not seen and ear hath not heard and neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that will love him. But I've come to tell you the same thing can be said about hell. I have not seen and ear hath not heard and neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that will not of that awful place called hell. I wish that each one of us could get a vision of that terrible place called hell. Because if you got a vision of that place called hell, you would call your lost brother and you would tell him to get right with God. You would call your lost sister and tell him to get right with God. You would call your lost mother or your lost dad and you would tell him to get right with God. My friend, I wish we could go over to the edge of this world and look over in the side of the eternal damned and get a vision of that awful place called hell. Can somebody say amen? There's some things I want to speak to you about in this service tonight about that terrible place called hell. If I can, God being my helper, I want to paint a picture in your mind of what that awful place called hell is like. No, as far as these natural eyes is concerned, we cannot see hell. There's no way we can walk over to the edge of the world and see what's going on in that place called hell. But God being my helper tonight with the pen of God's word. I want to paint a picture in your mind that you won't soon forget concerning that awful, terrible, horrible pit called hell. The first thing I think you need to know tonight about that awful place called hell is that hell is a place of total darkness. Can somebody say amen to that? I believe that it's physical darkness, but I believe more than that it is a place of spiritual darkness. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Oliver? I mean it's a midnight that sets in on the soul that will never end. It's darkness, my friend, that man cannot comprehend. Spiritual darkness in the sense that there will be no gospel light that shines in that awful place called heaven. There will never be in that awful 
place called hell. There will never be a godly life that will walk in front of you that testifies to you about the grace of God. There will never be anointed song sung in your ear. Nobody will ever tell you the story of Jesus and his love. Hell is a place of darkness. It will be eternal darkness, unending weeping, unending regrets, unending hate, and unending misery. It is a place of spiritual darkness. You'll never hear the preacher preach about Calvary again. You'll never hear the preacher preach about the love of God again. You'll never hear anybody sing a sweet song about Jesus in your ears again. There'll never be a dear old saint of God on your knees calling your name in prayer. It's a place of darkness, spiritual darkness, a midnight like men have never known. Don't go to hell, can you say amen? Hell is a place, my friend, of total darkness. It is also a place, my friend, of total despair. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Oliver? Hell is a place where there is no hope. Hell is a place where there is no optimism. Hell is a place where there is no faith. Hell is a place where there is no encouragement. Hell is a place where there's never a kind word spoken. Hell is a place where there is no singing, and there's no love, and there's no smiling children, and there's no smiles on anybody's face. It's a place where the grace of God cannot reach you. There is no forgiveness and there is no God in that awful place called hell. If you can think of a more hopeless condition to be in, you tell me about it. But hell, my friend, is a place of despair. And total despair it is. There's not even the hope of dying in that awful place called hell. Would to God I could come to this pulpit and tell you that after you're there 70 or 80 years that you die. I wish to God I could tell you that after a little while they'll let you out. But once you're in there, friend, it's got a door to get in, but you can search it day and night. There's not an exit out of hell. There's no exit out of that place called hell. You say, Brother Oliver, couldn't God have let people out of that place called hell? Couldn't God some way, somehow have devised a mean whereby men could get out of hell. He did when the Son of God walked up Calvary's hill under the weight of an old rugged cross with my sins on his back and he reached out with one hand and grabbed the Holy God and he reached out with the other hand and grabbed a lost and dying world and on Calvary's hill he opened up a fountain in the house of David for sin and uncleanness and he opened up a door whereby men could be saved. You don't have to go to hell but you've got to make the choice now. It's a place where there is no relief. It's a place where there is no hope. It's a place, my friend, where there's not even the hope of God. Hell is a place, my friend, of total alienation. I did not say it was a place of annihilation. Do not believe the Jehovah's Witness. Do not believe the Worldwide Church of God. Do not believe the Seventh-day Adventist who will tell you that you go to hell and burn up. You won't find it anywhere in the confines of this book. It is a place of total alienation. My friend, you are alienated from God. You are alienated from the family of God. You are alienated, my friend, throughout all eternity away from God, but you will always be there. Yes. Hell is a place of total alienation. There may be times when you feel alone here. There may be times, my friend, when you feel like nobody loves you and nobody cares about you now. But if you wake up in that awful place called hell, I've come to tell you you're going to find that this world was a far better place to live than in hell. I hear folks joke and say, well, if I go to hell, all of my friends will be there. You wouldn't even wish hell on one of your enemies. I've come to tell you hell is a horrible place. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a reality to those that don't know God. was not originally prepared for me. Amen? I said hell was not originally prepared for men. The Bible tells us in Matthew 25 and 41 that it was prepared for the devil 
had his angels. Why was he prepared for him? Because the devil, that high archangel, one day said, I will ascend up unto the throne of God and I will exalt myself above the throne of God. And rebellion came into his heart and two-thirds of the angels in heaven rebelled against the God of heaven with Lucifer, the son of the morning. But Jesus said, I saw him as he was cast down from heaven like lightning and the hell that I'm preaching about tonight was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was prepared for rebels. But you hear what this gospel preacher is trying to tell you tonight. The problem in Pentecost today is outright rebellion that's in our pews. Folks will say, bless God, I live like I want to live. I'll go where I want to go. I'll dress like I want to dress. I'll go anywhere I want to go and do anything I want to do. And that's rebellion and rebels go to hell. Amen. People say, bless God, nobody's going to tell me i got to go to church. Nobody's going to tell me I've got to pay tithes. Nobody's going to tell me I can't wear whatever I want to wear or go to any kind of worldly place I want to go. That's rebellion in your heart. And rebellion is going to send you to hell. God sends rebels to hell. Did you know that a hell is not going to change you from what you are right now? It's amazing to me how some ornery scoundrel lived ungodly all of his life, dies, and suddenly we turn him into a saint with our conversation. Amen. I mean, somebody died. Well, he was a good man. He loved his children. He paid his... I don't care if he joined every organization in town. I don't care, friend, if he was on the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Club. I don't care if he was a Mason or an odd fellow or whatever. They go to hell, too. Amen. I don't care if he's the best moral man in this county. I don't care if he loved his wife and loved his children and paid his bills. If he was not born again, he woke up in that awful place called hell. Can somebody say that? Everybody that had him in the Calvary, everybody whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast in the lake of fire that burned with brimstone, which is the second death. Right. That's hell won't change you from what you are. Revelation 21 and 11 says uh, that Jesus is going to say, let it, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I want to be numbered among the righteous and the holy, not the unjust and the filthy. When you go to hell, friend, it's not going to change you from what you are now. That's right, it's amazing to me how we turn someone into a saint just because they die. I've come to tell you, friend, that sweet old grandma that you used to go to her house for Thanksgiving, I don't care, friend, if she don't know God, she's going to hell just like the murderer. She's going to hell just like the rapist. She's going to hell just like the abominable. She's going to hell just like everybody else that don't know God. That sweet old grandpa that used to sit in a chair in the shade trees. Uh, my friend, I'll come to tell you, if you don't know God, he's going to hell just like everybody else that don't know God. That teenager that really hadn't experienced too much sin in their life, but if they've never been to Calvary, unless they've never had the blood of Jesus Christ applied, they're going to wake up in that awful place called hell. I've come to tell you, friend, hell isn't going to change you from what you are now. That rich man in hell is still saying sin lasts up down here to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Hell hasn't changed his attitude. Hell hasn't changed his mind. He still thinks he's better than Lazarus. Come on. I've come to tell you that drunkard will still be craving a drink in hell. The liar will still be telling lies in hell. The curser will still be cursing in hell. The luster will still have lust in his heart in hell. And if you've got sin raining in your life tonight, friend, hell isn't going to burn it out of you. It'll just intensify it that much more. There's a torment in hell like you've never known before. Hell is a place, my friend, of total timelessness. You say, what do you mean by that? My friend, there's not a pocket watch in hell. There's not a clock in hell. There's not a calendar in hell. You're 
no sooner getting out of hell when you've been there a trillion years than you were the first day that they locked the gate behind you. On every chain in hell is written forever. Every crackling flame in hell says forever. And the million screaming voices in that awful place called hell are shouting forever, forever, forever. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mark 9 and 44 said, Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, and the smoke of their torment doth ascend up day and night. Revelation 14 and 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Hell is a place where there is no watch. Hell is a place where there is no hours. Heaven is a place where there is no calendar. When you're there, you're there. Once you're there, friend, if you've been there a million years, you're no sooner getting out than you were the first day that you're there. Hallelujah. Life with Jesus is endless hope. But life without Him is a hopeless end. Ever dying, never dead. Forever and ever separated from God. The Bible says that hell is a place of total torment. Torment like you've never known before. Oh, I hear people, somebody's body's wrapped with pain and they die and folks say, well, they're out of their torment now or they're out of their misery now. If they didn't know God, they just began to know misery. Amen. If they don't know God, they just begin to know what the anguish and the torment of hell is like. The Bible tells us that hell has many torments. Believe what you want to believe about it, but thus saith the Lord. Hell is a place where there's fire. Hell is a place where there's smoke. Hell is a place where a million demons will crawl on your soul speaking blasphemies. But my friend, the worst thing about hell is not the fire. And the worst thing about hell is not the choking smoke. And the worst thing about hell are not the demons that crawl all over your soul. But the worst thing about hell is the fact that you'll know that you are eternally separated from the love of God. And the grace of God cannot reach you anymore. And if you go there, you'll know that you turn your back on Calvary. You trample the blood under your feet. And you made up your mind, this is my choice. thing about hell is that your memory will never die. Every gospel song you've ever heard will ring over and over in your ears. Every gospel sermon that you ever heard will be like a tape player going over and over in your mind. Every godly life that ever crossed your path will testify in your mind every day that you're there in that awful place called hell. Remember what Abraham said to that rich man. He said, remember, son, remember, son, and that's the one thing you'll never be able to choke out, and that is your memory. You'll always remember, I didn't have to come to this place. You'll remember every altar call that you sat there and rejected the ruling power of the Holy Ghost. You'll remember every sermon that the preacher threw out the gospel in and tried to win your soul. You will remember in hell. Amen. Hell is never full. One preacher said, there's going to be more people in heaven than there are in hell. I said, how ludicrous can you get? Amen. I've never read where heaven was getting bigger. Amen. 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 I've never read where heaven's gates were open and wider. Amen. 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 But I have read where Jesus said, the way to get to heaven is a straight and narrow way, and the gate is straight and few there be, which enter therein at, because he said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that live unto destruction, and many are going in there. The masses are going in there. Humanity is dropping off into eternity without God. Hell is getting bigger every day. Jesus said the straight way leads to heaven. But the broad way leads to hell. Yeah. My friend, no man is an island. Amen. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Oliver? 
You're not going to go to heaven by yourself. And you're not going to go to hell by yourself. You're going to take somebody with you. I hear people say, well, I'm just going to live my own life and do my own thing. And what I do doesn't affect anybody but me. No, sir, friend. Somebody's following in the footsteps that you leave behind. Somebody's watching the example that you live. Your children are going to come along in the life that you live now, my friend. And chances are they won't live as close to God as you are right now. You better live closer to God than what you're doing right now because chances are the devil's going to try to make some inroads into your life. Somebody's watching and somebody's following and somebody's listening. You're not going to go to heaven by yourself. If you go, somebody's going to make up their mind to go with you. But if you go to hell, you can wake up in hell with your wife. You can wake up in hell with your children. If you go there, you're going to take somebody with you. Amen. Hell's a place where you wouldn't want to take your family. Amen. Amen? I said that hell is a place where you wouldn't want to take your family. You say, who is in hell? The beast is going to be in hell. The false prophet is going to be in hell. And the Bible says every nation that forgets God, and that means America, is going to hell. Amen. 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 Revelation 21 and 18 says the fearful and the unbeliever and the, and the uh, abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Don't take your family to hell. Hell is not a joke. I hear people say, well, if I go to hell, all my friends will be there. Oh, friend, if you do go to hell, you'll wish that none of your family, none of your friends, not even your worst enemy would go to that awful place called hell. Hell is a horrible place. Hell John's in hell. There'll be no James in hell. There'll be no Simon Peter's in hell. And there'll be no Apostle Paul's in hell. There'll be no Moses in hell. There'll be no Abraham in hell. There'll be no Jacob or Daniel or Jeremiah's in that awful place called hell. But Cain is in hell and he still hates his brother. There's still murder in his heart. Korah's in hell and he's still saying I'm just as holy as Moses is. Achan's in hell and he's still got lying and stealing in his heart. The golden calf worshippers are naked dancing around in the flames of hell. Ahab, that hater of the prophet of God, is in that awful place called hell. That painted woman Jezebel is still in that awful place called hell. Tonight, Goliath is in hell and he still has hate in his heart for David. Pilate's in hell tonight and he's trying to wash his hands of the, of the blood of this innocent man. King Agrippa is in that awful place called hell and he says almost I became a Christian and I and Sapphira are in hell and they're still lies on their lips to God. Felix is in hell and he says when I have a more convenient season I would have called for somebody to preach the gospel but it's too late now. Judas Iscariot is in hell and he'll tell you I betray innocent blood. Don't go Hell is home to everybody that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you know the Lord in the free pardon of sin, heaven is awaiting all those who leave this life to go to the next life. Think about it tonight. If last night we were preaching about the splendors and the glories and the beauties and the marvelous things that await us on the other side. If that don't make you want to go to heaven, I hope that getting a vision of that awful place called hell will make you want to turn around tonight and get right with God and make heaven your home. Because as surely, my friend, as there is a heaven to gain, there is a hell to shun. Old friend, I love to preach about heaven. I really don't like to preach about hell. I love to preach about being saved. I really don't like to preach about being lost. 
I love to preach about the blessings of God. I really don't like to preach about temptations and heartaches and trials. But my friend, I believe we need to give equal time. As surely as there's a heaven that we shouted about last night, there's a hell that men need to see and repent and get right with God, even in this service tonight. There's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. Hell is just as real, just as real as the heaven that we're planning on going to. But if you don't know Jesus as your Savior tonight, if you've never been to an old-fashioned altar and there repented of your sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter what church you belong to, doesn't matter how right you may live, hell is your heart. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father. 